Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to try to teach you everything you need to know about the Fed's new framework for changing their policy rate, the federal funds rate. Here's the deal, guys. I almost lost my pin right there. The Fed used to follow a limited reserve framework, okay? That's what was taught for years and years and years, really decades in classrooms, was the limited reserve framework. But in 2008, everything changed. The Fed put tons of reserves into the banking system. And that's kind of a weird way to even say that, okay? When they put tons of reserves into the banking system, basically what they're doing is crediting commercial banks' reserve balances at the Fed. That's right. They credited the reserve balances of commercial banks at their institution. Because when we talk about bank reserves like we're about to, you need to be thinking, oh, that's commercial banks reserve balances at the Fed. And anyhow, so what they did is they credited those reserve balances. How, how, how did they do that? Why did they do that? Well, they wanted to provide liquidity to those banks. And what they did is they just bought up a ton of assets from those banks. And when they bought those assets from the banks, like government bonds and mortgage-backed securities, they credited the reserve balances of those commercial banks at the Fed. And those reserve balances went way up. And so reserves were no longer limited anymore. They were ample. And I'm going to show you that graphically in just a second, but there's a little more groundwork, okay, that I want to get out of the way right from the beginning, okay? The policy rate of the Fed is the federal funds rate. And what do we even mean by that? This is a targeted rate. That means they do not control it. It is not an administered rate. I want to talk about administered rates later. This is a targeted rate. They don't control it, but they have a ton of influence over it. They can get it to be just about whatever they want it to be, generally speaking, okay? But anyhow, this is their policy rate. It is the federal funds rate. They target this rate. They change it in hopes or with the desire to have those changes transmit to the rest of the economy. See, this is what we call a short-term interest rate, and they have a lot of emphasis uh, influence over this rate and over other short-term interest rates. And when they change those, they want to change pretty much all short-term interest rates and even change longer-term rates. And this is their policy tool. In fact, sometimes you might hear of the transmission mechanism being uh, talked about when it comes to the Fed. What's their transmission mechanism? This. They're changing the federal funds rate to transmit interest rate change to the economy um, at large, okay? So right now we're in February of 2023, we're fighting inflation. So they're raising the federal funds rate to raise pretty much as many interest rates in the economy as they possibly can, okay? Again, their targeted rate, not an administered rate. Now let's get to some to the graph and to some more of the nitty gritty here, okay? So the first thing I want you to see is we have a demand for reserves curve, okay? And this is the market for bank reserves. And right there, that's kind of hard to get your head around, okay? Because what's going on here is this is commercial banks' demand for holding reserve balances at the Fed, okay? Let me say that again. This curve is representing the demand, okay, of commercial banks to hold reserve balances at the the Fed. Now, the first thing I want you to understand is this demand curve is like all demand curves. It's a marginal benefit curve, okay? And what I mean by that is reserves held at the Fed provide benefits to commercial banks. One of the biggest ones being is it helps them settle payments when their depositors make write checks to other depositors, okay? So look, I'm bank A and my depositor goes out there and writes a check to somebody that banks at bank B. The Fed moves reserves from my bank over to that bank, okay? It helps the banking system basically work. It clears payments. That's one of the main reasons I want to hold reserve balances there. Also, reserve balances help me make loans. Not as much as they used to, but they still help me make loans. Why not as much as they used to is the Fed required reserve ratio, which is the amount of reserves that they require banks to hold at the Fed to make loans, well, that went down to zero. So they don't need them as much as they used to, but they still need them to make loans too. So they need them to settle payments, make loans. So they need reserves. That's the big thing. What I want you to know is they need reserves. This represents the marginal benefit of holding reserves. If they don't have many reserves, okay, back here, the benefit, their need for reserves is quite large, okay? So their benefit is quite uh, high, right? As they get more and more and more reserves, guess what? The benefit of having additional reserves is going down, right? Kind of the law of diminishing marginal utility. I get more and more reserves, the benefits is less and less of having additional reserves. Until I get to this point, and that is a really important point, because when that demand for reserve curves hits, 
hit the horizontal axis, okay, 0%. Reserves are ample. They are sufficient. Banks do not need them anymore, okay? There's no really marginal benefit. Will they hold more reserves? Absolutely. But only if the federal funds rate is zero will they hold more reserves. Now, the next thing I want you to understand is the federal funds rate, and this is important, is a cost, okay, to banks of holding reserves at the Fed. Why is the federal funds rate a cost of holding reserves at the Fed? It's either an explicit cost or an implicit cost. You see, one of the ways that banks can get reserves to hold them at the Fed is by going to the federal funds market. What's the federal funds market? That's where banks loan reserves to each other. That's interbank lending, bank to bank lending. Well, a bank can go there, borrow reserves, pay the federal funds rate. That's what we associate with the federal funds market, right? That's the interest rate of the federal funds market. They could pay the federal funds rate. That'll be an explicit cost of getting those reserves and go hold them at the Fed, right? So I go to the federal funds market, borrow reserves, and I put those in my reserve balances at the Fed, and I have to pay the federal funds rate, an explicit cost. But I can also get reserves from depositors, right? And if I get reserves from depositors, well, I just go hold them at the Fed, right? So the federal funds rate's not a cost. Oh, yes, it is. It's an implicit cost, right? Because I'm still foregoing it. I could head to the federal funds market and lend reserves at the federal funds rate, right? So it is a cost. It's either an explicit cost. If I got my reserves from the federal funds market, I have to pay the federal funds, right? Or it's an implicit cost. Even if I get it from my depositors, I'm foregoing the federal funds rate. So this is a cost. And again, since this is a cost, that gives us this downward slope, right? When you think of a demand curve, what do you have over here? Price. Price is a cost to the demander, and that's why it is downward sloping, okay? As that cost goes up, we're going to the quantity of demand is going to decrease. As that cost goes down, the quantity of demand is going to increase. So there we go. We've got our demand for reserves downward sloping. Again, one last time, this is the commercial bank's demand to hold reserves at the Fed, and it is written in relation to the federal fund rate, which is the cost of holding those reserves. And at this point, they are ample. Now, this is not how you're going to see the graph in your book. Why is it not how you're going to see the graph probably written in your book? Because the Fed has two administered rates. They have two administered rates. One of them is the discount rate. The discount rate is the interest rate the Fed charges banks to hold reserves at the Fed. So let's just say they set the discount rate to this percentage. See, I've got percentages there to remind you that there's a bunch of percentages. So I'm going to set the discount rate to say that percentage. Well, if that's what they set it to, they're saying, the Fed is saying, hey, banks, you can borrow reserves from us at this interest rate. Fed, uh, sorry, banks will not borrow at a higher federal funds rate. They won't go borrow at the federal funds market from other banks at a higher interest rate than the interest rate that they would have to pay to the Fed to get reserves. Okay, let me say that again. I got two ways to get reserves. I can go to the Fed or I can go to the federal funds market. I'm not going to go to the federal funds market and pay a higher federal funds rate than the interest rate I would have to pay to the Fed to get reserves. So the federal, sorry, the discount rate sets a ceiling. That's what we call it. That's a ceiling and we just get rid of that portion. There's not going to be a federal funds rate higher than the discount rate. So it sets a ceiling right there. Now, more importantly is the floor, okay? Now I want you to see right off the bat that it does intersect the horizontal axis. If the federal funds rate is zero, it will hit that line right there. But oftentimes the Fed does not want the federal funds rate to be zero. And the Fed has ways to lift it off of zero, okay? And the way it does that is another administered rate. And this administered rate is super important. It is the new number one policy tool of the Fed. Under that limited reserve framework, Open market operations, OMO, OMO, open market purchases, open market sales, that was the number one tool. The number one tool now is not OMO, it is interest on reserve balances, I-O-R-B, interest on reserve balances, which is exactly what it sounds like. It is the interest rate the Fed pays on reserve balances. Did you hear that? The Fed pays commercial banks for holding reserve balances, or at least it often does. Sometimes it can set the IRB all the way to zero, but oftentimes it's going to want to lift it up to lift the federal funds rate. And here's how that works, okay? Let's say they set the IORB right there. Now, that's going to create what's called a reservation rate. Now, that term is not the most important, but here's what we mean by it being a reservation rate. It sets a floor. Here is why, okay? 
no um, bank, no commercial bank will now supply federal uh, or will supply reserves to the federal funds market. Let me say this again. No commercial bank will now supply reserves to the federal funds market if the federal funds rate is below the IORB. They will just hold their reserves at the Fed. So let me say that again because it's really important. It's this concept of a reservation rate. When the Fed sets the IORB up here, then that means this portion of the demand curve is going to go away. And why is it going to go away? Because no federal funds rate will exist below it. Why will no federal funds rate exist below it? Because no commercial bank will go loan at the federal funds market at a federal funds rate that is below the interest rate they could earn by just keeping their reserves at the Fed. And so what happens when they set that IORB right there, then this portion goes away and it looks like this. And why does it just extend out there? Because, hey, I'll hold as many reserves as I can and go ahead and get that free money of interest on reserve balances. Again, this is the Fed paying commercial banks for holding reserves at the Fed. And so the demand for reserves curve goes just like that. Now, supply of reserves. Breaking the graph. 2008, just like I said, what did the Fed do? Is it increased reserve balances of commercial banks a ton? It took reserves from being like 20 to 40 billion dollars in total to I think today it might be like six trillion. Okay, it, it, it went. It, it took a little bit of time. It went to one trillion, two trillion, three trillion, but we're in the trillions. Okay, and so that's why we say we have a ample reserve framework. Reserves are now ample. This supply curve. The reason I put a break is it is way off to the right now. Okay, but. Still, where demand and supply intersect, give us our policy rate, the new federal funds rate, okay? Now, we do a little bit more work on this because there's one other thing to make sure that students fully understand that these two things are gonna be basically equal. Now, in reality, they're a little bit off, but just by very small uh, percentage points, okay? They're just about equal, and there's this concept of arbitrage to understand that. So here we go. Arbitrage. Fed. What does the Fed set? They set the IORB. That is their administered rate. Remember, that one they can set, okay? Then there is the federal funds market where the federal funds rate is set, okay? So at the federal funds market, we get the federal funds rate set. Now, let's just say that the IORB happened to be, say, see if I can fit in right here, 2%. And let's say that the FFR was 2.25. This concept of arbitrage would come into play. And here's how that would work. If the federal fund rate was 2.25 and the IORB was 2%, what would a commercial bank do? Commercial banks would simply go to the Fed, grab their reserves, okay, and take them to the federal funds market. They would supply them to the federal funds market. Now, I want you to understand something very important. I'm pulling reserves out of the Fed. Will that change the interest rate at the Fed? No. Why? Because the IORB is an administered rate. The Fed sets it. It is not subject to market activity. That's super important. But the federal funds rate is subject to market activity. It's a market-based rate. Yes, it's what the Fed targets. Yes, they have a ton of influence over it, and here's why. But it is not an administered rate. So anyhow, commercial banks go to the Fed, grab the reserves, supply them over here because they want to make 2.25, not 2%. So they supply them. Well, what's going to happen when we get this more supply at the federal funds market, a market-based rate? It will drive this interest rate down. How far? Until the federal funds rate equals 2%, okay? That would be because of an arbitrage opportunity for commercial banks. Oh, that's easy. I get free, you know, easy more money, right? Nope. When you start doing that, you're going to drive that down. How about if the federal funds rate was below? If the federal funds rate was, say, 1.75 and the Fed set the IORB to 2%, what would happen? Well, what would banks do? They would go borrow at 1.25. They would demand, right? reserves at the federal funds market. Hey, I'm gonna go borrow. How much will you borrow? I'll borrow as much as I can. It's an arbitrage. It's kind of like free money here. I'll borrow as much as I can. Yes, I'll have to pay 1.75, but I'll borrow as much as I possibly borrow because I can earn 
2% at the Fed. So they go in demand. Well, that increase in demand is going to drive the federal funds rate up, up to 2%. Okay. So here is the deal. The big thing that you need to know. All right. These two things are now going to be pretty much locked together. Okay. That IORB and that FFR are going to be equal for two important reasons. One is that reservation rate. I first talked about concept where the IORB sets a floor. And then for this reason of arbitrage, okay, this point, this reason of arbitrage pulls those two rates together. So feel confident that these two rates are going to move very closely together. This allows the Fed now to change what they want to change. The federal funds rate by changing the IORB. Hey, we've got inflation out there. Inflation is a problem, right? Inflation is above our 2% target. We can lift the IORB. And when we lift the IORB, this portion goes away. Just get it like that all goes away. We got it set right there. We get a new intersection between the demand for reserves and supply of reserves right here. And this gives us our new federal funds rate, our new policy rate. And we're doing that to transmit higher interest rates to the rest of the economy. Now, as we wrap up this video, what was the old system again? A limited reserve framework. In a limited reserve framework, the supply of reserves, which is determined by the Fed, Okay, and that's why it's vertical. The supply of reserves is determined by the Fed. Okay, they have control over the supply of reserves, actually a lot of control over the supply of reserves. Okay, pretty much complete control over the supply of reserves. Okay, so the Fed has that. In a limited reserve framework, this supply of reserves, remember I got a break in my graph, it was way over here, right? It wasn't six trillion, it was 20 to 40 billion. It was over here, okay? And when it was there, what would the Fed do? They would use open market operation, open market purchases and sales to shift this thing, right? Left and right, shift it right. What happened? The federal funds rate went down, shift it left. What happened? The federal funds rate went up. They used to use open market operations to shift the supply of reserves to change the policy rate. No more. Ample reserve framework. Supply is way to the right. They now use their new policy tool, the IORB, to change the federal funds rate. I know that was a long video, but I think that hopefully taught you everything you need to know, basically, about the ample reserve framework and how it works and how the Fed now changes their policy rate, their benchmark rate, to hopefully transmit interest rate changes to the rest of the economy, hence monetary policy. Hope it helped. See you in the next video.